This is the Hard Thing Podcast. Today, we are overcoming average. Welcome back to the Hard Thing Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lewis, and this is the podcast that helps you win the war on average in your daily life. And how do we do that? We do that by getting you the tips, tricks, tools, tactics, whatever you need in order for you to do hard things, overcome obstacles, step up above mediocrity, and have a better life. And on and to do that, on Mondays, we actually get you conversations with high-performing individuals who have done hard things and live to tell the tale. And we also pull from their stories action items and insights that you can implement in your own life to do hard things and level up and, and just be a better person. On Thursdays, we actually have our, our, our The Forge show, our show The Forge, where co-host Ty Crockett and myself, we actually do the action items that we get from today's guest. So if you want to uh, tune into that, come back on Thursday, listen to this show. But let me tell you about today's guest first. Today, I talk with master motivator, Christopher Roche. And uh, let me tell you, he is an awesome guy. Uh, he's super motivating and super fun to talk to and super nice. Just He gave me personally a, a lot of advice and a lot of help after the show. So I know you guys are going to get so much from the show just because of who he is and how he shows up. So without further ado, go ahead and listen to my conversation with Christopher Roche. All right. Well, thank you for being on my show, Chris. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. Cool, cool. Let's drop in. Excellent. Well, let's get started with the question that I ask all my guests, as always, Chris, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? Wow, Justin. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to, to share myself with uh, with your listeners and get to know you better as well. So what's the hardest thing I've ever had to do? Uh, that's quite a big, uh, a big question to ask, but uh, I, I would have to say, honestly, um, I'll tell you what the hardest thing I had to do, and then I'll kind of go in the backstory of that. The hardest thing I ever had to do was to place myself first in my life and love myself first and believe that I could actually achieve a life of magnitude and impact regardless of my upbringings. Now, the backstory on that, Justin, is that um, I grew up in Los Angeles, California in Inglewood, which is a, a city in South, Southeast Los Angeles. Um, it was a very disadvantaged and very poor community. I was uh, brought into the world not knowing who my biological father was. Uh, my mother had uh, an, aff an affection for men, let's just put it that way. So uh, I did not know who my biological father was. He was married, I found out later with other kids. And so when I was brought into the world, it was my mom, myself, and my seven-year-old sister who was from another marriage. <laughs> Or from another guy. Um, so immediately when I grew up, it was it was basically me and my mom for the most part. My sister would go back and stay with her father every couple of weeks, and he was well off, and he was he was he was good to go. Uh, but meanwhile, in our house with uh, with my mom and her cats and her psychological disorders and things, um, it very quickly became a a matter of survival in the house for myself. And that's what I think about when I was young. And throughout my young life, uh, leaving Inglewood and moving to Anaheim, California, here in Southern California, uh, thinking my life was going to be better. My mom actually met a guy and they were about to get married and my sister was going to live with us. And I thought, OK, at six years old, I'm going to go have a medium or a middle class life and I'm going to have a family and things are going to kind of get straightened out. I was just starting to figure out who I was and I was going to start going to first grade. And I'm like, OK, cool. And that's when more of the physical violence started, uh, the mental violence started, uh, the physical violence between my mom and the person that she was about to marry. Um, I usually do not use labels with that person. Um, however, I have learned to forgive him. That's another story. Uh, but throughout that tumultuous time living in Anaheim, it was uh, it was just absolute chaos and madness. Uh, up until the point when um, I started the seventh grade and I was always a good kid in school pretty much, but I was bullied throughout my entire life. I did not have self-confidence. I did not know how to defend myself. I did not know anything. My mom didn't teach me those things. My mom taught me how to do as I was told, uh, seen be not heard and um, to just shut up. Essentially, that was kind of my childhood in a way. And she really did try. It's not all bad. But um, what happened is everybody left us. My, her, her boyfriend or soon to be husband wound up being husband, he left. My sister decided she had enough, she left. She went to go live with her dad. So it was just me and my mom. And then after um, a various few setbacks, we wound up uh, losing the house that we were living in. So I went from being a seventh grade kid, you know, going to school and everything to being a, a homeless seventh grade dropout who now would be living in a station wagon with 18 cats and two dogs with a mother with psychological disorders and chemical dependencies. 
Um, it was crazy. It was, it was absolutely unbelievable, Justin. And through the next four years, I lived on the streets. I lived in the backseat of the station wagon. I lived in abandoned vans. I lived in garages. I dug through dumpsters. I collected cans and every cans and bottles and newspapers every day so that the cats could eat. So my mom could have cigarettes. And then at the end of the day, if we were lucky, I got a box of crackers or whatever it was for us to, to, to tide us over till the next day until the next battle. And we did that for about four years off and on every once in a while staying in a sleazy motel you know if we got money from a, a church or if my grandfather sent us money or something like that and uh you know i tried to commit suicide twice <clears throat> during that ordeal fortunately i sucked at it and so um when that started happening you know things were getting pretty bleak and i did i figured that and we were staying in this 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 trashy motel she was doing the yard work i was working three jobs i was working two telemarketing jobs and i was working at carl's jr at the age of 15 16 years old i lied about my age um it was crazy my mom was 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 working for a drug dealer in the in the motel this is not a joke she was working for a drug dealer in the motel running drugs and meanwhile being an informant to the anaheim police department i'm not even making this stuff up i mean she thought she was like the secret agent it was all this crazy shit and here i am you know working and taking the bus and riding my bike to keep us going right um so i come back to the motel one day and i used to smoke cigarettes and i walk in and this black guy says hey man you want to buy a carton of reds and I was like, oh, no, man, I don't smoke Marlboros. I said, I'm cool, man. I said, I appreciate it. And he goes, and he started punking me a little bit. And I was just, I had long hair, leather jacket. Um, and this motel was like literally just the corner. It was like a prison. It was like every type of person you could imagine was there. There was cool people there. There was crazy people there. There was, you know, prostitution. I mean, it was, it was just something you could write a fucking book about. And, uh, and I told the guy, I said, no, man, I said, I don't smoke those. I smoke cools. And if you, I mean, if, you, if you've been around, I'm, 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 I just talk very candidly. I, I, I speak with, with, uh, with uh, great respect to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but stereotypically, black guys would smoke uh, uh, menthols and white guys would smoke Marlboros or non-menthols and stuff like that. And so he thought I was making fun of him because of cools. And I said, no, dude, I said, I don't smoke Marble Reds because all my buddies smoke Marble Reds and I don't have enough money. So when I have a cigarette, they're like, hey, let me bum. And if I have menthols, then they don't want to bum cigarettes off of me. <laughs> And, uh, and I said, that's the God's honest truth. And so he goes, man, I think you're, I think you're bullshitting me. I think I'm just going to talk. I mean, I know you got to bleep stuff. Uh, he goes, I think you're bullshitting me. And I said, okay. I said, actually, dude, I'm not. And I went to go reach in my back pocket where I had a pack of cools. And I said, dude. And I was like, literally like this. And all of a sudden click, I had cold metal pressed against my forehead. We were underneath a carport. And I was like, Oh, uh -oh. And I said, and I said, dude, dude, dude. He's like, oh, is it because I'm black? Are you trying to make fun of me? Da, da, da. I'm sick of white people, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, I grew up in Los Angeles. My best friends were black. I said, it's not about the color of your skin. It's about the cigarettes. I don't smoke those. And I pulled my pack of cigarettes out and I showed it to him. And he's all, man, you know, you, I think you're just punking me and da, da, da. And I said, listen, I said, and I got, I just got pissed. I mean, I'd already tried to kill myself twice. I was already like, I'm going to get out of here either dead or in jail or on my own accord. And it didn't look like I was going to get out of there on my own accord. And I said, if you're going to pull a trigger, pull a trigger. I said, let's just do it. I said, just do it. Right. And I screamed it right in the middle of the parking lot. I'm like, you're going to do it. Just do it. And I was ready. I thought, oh my God, there's going to be one click. I'm going to hear a click and that's going to be it, but it's going to be done. And this other guy, Will, came running up. I still remember Will to this day. Um, and he was like, no, no, no. His mom's his mom and his mom is cool. They're cool. They're cool, man. They're cool. They help me out. They give me money. They give me cans, blah, blah. No, they're cool people. This guy was a new guy in the in the block. And so gun came away from my head and he's kind of just looking at me. I said, dude, seriously, seriously. I said, it's nothing about you, dude. It's just this. I said, I've got friends. I'm not one of those people. I dig all people, you know. And so we want to be in friends and everything. But, you know, uh, a couple of days later, one of those jobs that I worked at was telemarketing out of somebody's apartment, which sounds creepy. <laughs> um, but I was setting roofing contracting appointments and me and my buddy that lived in the motel, we would go there every day. And uh, we showed up one day. It was this place in Huntington Beach. It was a nice apartment. And we get in there one day and uh, the the boss guy, we did the telemarketing out of one of his bedrooms. And he goes, well, guys, I got good news and I got bad news. And I said, okay, what's the bad, what's the good news? Cause I've had enough bad news to last a lifetime. I'm 17 years old at this point. Um, I've got an attitude, like, I don't get like whatever. And he goes, well, he goes, um, he goes, the good news is I'm going to leave you in my apartment. And we're like, what? He goes, well, I got to tell you the bad news. And I said, well, what's the bad news? And he says, I'm going to move the operations to Dallas, Texas. He goes, but I know you guys have been trying to get out of that motel. I know you guys have been trying to save up first and last. Um, so what I want to do, because you guys are such great guys, I want to leave you my apartment. I want to sign over the lease to you. Um, and then you can have a place to stay. And I was just like, we were just like Huntington Beach. They had their own. I mean, it was like a, a, like the Taj Mahal. It was a two bedroom apartment. It was 800 bucks a month, which is crazy. Like 
two miles from the beach and compared to where we were, I mean, holy, holy wow. Um, so we looked at each other I'm like, oh my God, we could do this. You know, we can get your brother, we can get so-and-so and we kind of make it. Da, da, da. We're like, oh man, this is our chance to get out. Da, 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 da. And even my brain, I was thinking after everything I'd been through that my mom would finally go, you know what, Chris, you know, I've screwed your life up enough. You know, I have, I've put you through enough. It's you, I, we even, we even won the lottery while we were in the motel. We won $5,000 and still did not get out of the motel because of her cats and her stuff. So I go back to the motel thinking, you know what, my mom's going to finally tell me to, to, to go to go. It's a long winded answer for your question, but, um, it definitely has points in it. And so I go back to the motel and I was like, you know, I'm kind of scared to say this, but you know, she's, she's got to see, she's got to see, you know, all these different things that I'm doing, all these drugs and, and, and violence and drinking and all this other stuff, drinking and driving, um, that she's going to say, you know what, Chris, it's time for you to go be a man. It's time to go live your life, you know, cause there was no exit. There was no, there was no plan of what we were going to do to get out of here. And thinking about the gun against my head, thinking about trying to kill myself, thinking about all this stuff. And, I'm, and I sat on the, the, the top stair of the motel that night, crushed. She called me every name in the book. She goes, if you do this, you're an asshole. You're this, you're selfish, you're da, da, da. And up until that point, Justin, I did everything for her. I wanted her validation. I wanted her approval. I didn't want to hurt her. You know, everybody else abandoned her. I felt it was my responsibility. And I was only 17. And I look back now and I'm just like, holy crap. I was such a grown up for being so young. And I looked at the drugs and the prostitution and the cops and everything else. And I thought, I'm not going to get out of here unless I make a choice to get out of here. So in answer to your question, the toughest decision I ever had to make was to go against my mom and put myself first. And I went back to her and I thought about it. And I said, mom, I have to go. If I don't go, I don't know what my life's going to be. I'm not leaving you. I'm leaving the motel. So I'm going to go live at this place, but I'll come back here and help you take care of the cats. You got to get a job. Da, 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 da. And of course, you know, call me all sorts of names. Wouldn't let me take my car. I almost had to have her arrested to, to get my car back. She's like, you're not taking the car. I'm like, mom, it's my car. I, I, I traded different things and work and I got this piece of shit, you know, 73 Ford Maverick that ran, but I needed a car. And so it got ugly, but that's the answer to my question is that I had to leave my mom in a situation that was dangerous, that was uncertain. Um, but ultimately it was, it was, it was the trajectory of my life. And I, and I'm so glad I made that decision. So there's your answer. Please fire away. Awesome. Um, one of the biggest questions that comes to mind at the end of your story, your recounting is and I, I got to phrase this right. I'm, I'm not a very tactful person. Sometimes I say things in the wrong way, but you were able to get out and, and you wanted to get out. Why were like, what was different about you that first of all, you wanted to get out? Like do most people want to get out of that type of lifestyle or are they just stuck or, and, and then like, why were you able to get out? If that makes sense. No, no, no. Great question. Great question. You know, it really comes down to, and I've learned this through all of my coaching, all of my speaking, uh, all of my mentoring to young kids. Uh, there's two types of people in this world. There's victims or there's victors. And you can have a victim mindset, but still desire to be a victor, or you can have a victim mindset and choose to still be a victim because that works for you. Um, we all know those victims in our life. Oh, this is so hard. And, and I just don't feel good. I don't know what to do. Hey, have you, are you drinking water? Are you hydrating? Are you, are you getting some exercise? You know, no, I, I really need to do that. You know, I just don't have time. Oh, what do you do all day? Well, I get up and I feed the cats and then I look at the paper. I'm like, so those people that, that works for them. Oh, mad. You know, you're a victim too. victim, you know, misery loves company. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, and then there's people out there that go, you know what? I may be a victim right now, but I know that there's something out there for me. I'm not sure when or where or how it's going to happen, but I believe that somehow, some way I'm going to be able to get out of the situation. And those are the people that I love. They need that glimmer of hope. They need that opportunity to say, Hey, listen, how did you do it? And I've had people say, well, it must be nice to be you, Chris. You're always so positive. You're always so happy. You're always so motivated. You're always, you feel like you always have the answers. And I'm like, guys, you don't see me the other, you know, 12 hours a day, the other 13 hours a day where I might be introspective. I might be quiet. I might be depressed. I might be, you know, having feelings of anything like normal people do, but I'm always a fighter. I'm always a way to figure out how to get out of the situation. Um, so yeah, it's really a matter of, of what it is that you want to do and being able to see the bigger picture. And, and I'll share this with you. While I was in that motel, I was just telling the story the other day. Um, somebody handed me Tony Robbins cassette tapes and it was personal power, his first personal power series. And I remember, I think they got him out of the trash can and they said, here, you need to, you need to listen to these. And I was, I'm always been a music guy since the, since I was such a little kid. I say I was vaccinated, I was vaccinated by a phonograph needle. I absolutely <laughs> love music. And uh, I said, what band is this? 
You know, I'm like, what is this like a, a box set or something? Like, I didn't know what the hell it was. And uh, they go, no, they're, they're, they're personal development tapes. So I got them out of trash and I got a bunch of them if you want to listen to them. But here, I thought you might use these. I'm like, what, what, what? And I, 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 they sat on the floor in my car forever. And finally I popped a cassette in and I was listening to it. And I was like, huh? What is this guy? T- I don't even, I didn't know nothing about it. My mom told me I was stupid most of my life. And uh, I started listening to it and I started listening to it. And this guy was a good guy. He was a good guy. He was, he was in the motel, but he had hard times, but he was a clean guy. He didn't do drugs. And I think he kind of took me on as a, as a mentor, as a, as a, almost like a father figure in a way. Um, Cause he would help me work on my cars. He would give me advice. Uh, he was just, he was just a cool dude. And so from listening to those tapes, I started realizing that we are not, we are, we should not listen to other people make decisions for us. You know, there comes a point, and I don't think some people realize this, that our parents and our, and our, and our family make decisions for us. Oh, you need to do this. You need to wear that. You need to eat this. You need to go here. You need to act like this. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. And unless you have parents that are willing to see you succeed and see you go off into the world, you may not have that opinion that you could do it on your own because everybody's always told you what to do in your life. Uh, so for me, you know, you have to have a belief and a faith that you're here on this earth, having this journey for a bigger purpose than to just serve other people who are insecure and are, uh, destined to be, uh, miserable for the rest of their life. So for me, it's just about breaking out and just inspiring people to think differently about their current situation and their past situation. Cause so many times, Justin, Justin, we're always looking in the, in the, in the rear view mirror. Oh, I should have done this. I could have done this. And those people were this, and this is why I'm this way. And da, da, da. the past is nothing but electrical energy in our brain. So we, we can reformulate our perspective on that to make it working for us instead of against us. I hope I answered the question. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I heard it. Someone once said, and it wasn't me, so don't attribute this to me, but you can either be a victim or someone who has been victimized. There's a difference. Uh, and I think what they're trying to say is that victims, like once you become a victim, you're, you're a victim until you change yourself. But if you've been victimized, you're not a victim. You just have a circumstance that, you know, is, is plaguing you in, in one way or another. So I find that very fascinating as well that your, your mentor kind of stepped in because in, in talking to a lot of my guests who have done these hard things, you'd be surprised how often one of the catalysts for them being able to kind of change their life was someone else who may or may not have been in a better situation, but just being able to like kind of show them like, hey, th- there's more to you than you think, you know, th- there's more to your potential than you think. And I think I find that also fascinating that you have kind of turned around and done that same thing for other kids in your mentoring. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I believe that we're all here to be a light and be a beacon to help one another up, not push each other down, not keep each other back. I've always felt like that. And as soon as I started getting a taste of success and realizing what the formula for success was, um, I immediately, immediately it became my life's mission to go, especially go back and help young kids because getting through that process of, of just my childhood and then then growing up so fast. I mean, I had a psychiatrist ask me one time and it was a very poignant question that I'll never forget. And I'll share it with you and your viewers because it really opened my eyes. Uh, she said, when did you stop being a kid? And cause she knew what I was. I've always been a very, very driven person. Once I figure something out, I am driven to find out what that end result is. Uh, and I, I sat there and I stopped and I went, And I thought about it very carefully. I said, when did I stop being a kid? And I thought about, okay, what's the definition of a kid? Because we got to first define what it is that we're we're answering. And sometimes we define the wrong things when we're answering things. And therefore, that's why we get the wrong outcomes in our life. So it's very important to think about that. And I thought, child, okay, play, you know, feeling free, feeling spontaneous, feeling adventurous. I'm like, eh, seven years old. And she kind of just stepped back and she's like, okay, tell me more about that. And I said, well, I became a latchkey kid. I said, I had responsibilities. If I didn't do my responsibilities, I got beat. I had a can of a full can of Coke thrown at my head because I didn't fill the water dish all the way. Blood started dripping out of my head. My mom was like, oh, the cats are going to have blood in their water. Clean that out. You know, it was all just different stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everything just happens in our life for a reason, the season or a lifetime. And, and we can choose to be that same person or we can choose to, to bust out of that. And it's just like uh, the analogy I was using the other day. Most of us is all, have all watched a caterpillar become a butterfly. And if you guys have never done that, here's a great opportunity. Here's a suggestion for you to do with your kids, with your family, with yourself. Just do it. Go on Amazon and get uh, it's called a bucket of caterpillars. Uh, it's truly, truly amazing. It's, it's a, it's a, an analogy for life. I think that's what they call it. But seriously, you get in the mail, you get these little tiny little larva and it's amazing. You, you, you mostly do it with kids, but I, I would, I've recommended it for adults and you just sit there and watch the whole process of how they become these little dots 
And then like in a couple of days, they become these fat caterpillars and you're like, okay, they're cool. They've that, that now they're alive and they're grown and this is going to be their habitat. But no, just like us, we're born and we grow into these little malleable brains that usually indicate that we're going to be who we are by the age of five or six. I mean, psychological studies show that, you know, your kid once about five or six years old, that's the person they're, they're going to become. So that's why that first, those first years are so, so important, but we take them for granted because we think, oh, they're just a kid. They don't know anything. They're not learning anything. Right. I'll focus my energies when they're old enough to talk and think which is absolutely just ass backwards. Um, so when these, these caterpillars, you see this process and then all of a sudden you see them start to create their cocoon and you're like, okay, what is this? This is them pausing to say, listen, I need to become something different. I, my journey in life is to become something. My journey in life is to fly. And it's absolutely beautiful. You watch the process. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's messy. Uh, but it's beautiful. And then once the process starts happening, the awakening, you start seeing them poke through and you start seeing life come out of them. Um, you start feeling like that's like my hair on my arm goes up. It's just absolutely amazing. You realize, you know, we're born to fly. We're all born to soar. We're all born to achieve magnitudes. We're all here learning lessons. Uh, so seeing that process and seeing people do that, that's what I enjoyed helping people do is to get out of that cocoon of what was and realize what is supposed to be. I, I agree in that that is a very beautiful metaphor because from what I've read about the, the chrysalis and the caterpillar becoming a butterfly, in that process, they create that outer shell around themselves and internally, in a sense, they kind of div- dissolve their original body. They, they mm-hmm. just kind of become this goop and then from there, they form this new this new self and I think that sometimes uh, we don't we don't realize that that's what we have to do. Like we have to dissolve some past parts of ourselves in order to get the material to make a new self. You know what I mean? One thousand percent. I have done it a few times in my <laughs> life. You, it's just, it's a constant reinvention. It's a constant. Mm-hmm. You know, so many people look at you know, again, what was, and I want the comfortability and I want the certainty when COVID first started and I started doing more shows and go, doing lives to help people. So many people were sitting there hung on certainty. I want to go back to what what's comfortable and what's normal. Like life isn't supposed to be comfortable and normal. Mm-hmm. You know, we're here on a journey to learn lessons. I truly believe that. I believe that we're given tests. I believe we pass those tests. We learn our lessons. We help other people learn those lessons and we continue on to continue learning what our next lesson is. And if we don't learn that lesson in this lifetime, guess what? I truly believe, and I did not have this opinion two years ago. I'm just being honest. I thought it was bullshit. I believe that if we don't learn that lesson in this lifetime, we get to come back and learn it again. That yeah. that That is our journey. That's our soul's purpose is to come here and learn lessons. So when I personally see something that is, that is a obstacle or a challenge or something I have to deal with, you know, at first, of course, we don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with having that conversation. I don't want to deal with going through that pain or that 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 change or that metamorphosis. But again, if you use that metaphor, you think, okay, I'm going to get through this shit right now. I'm going to get through this because I'm strong. I'm determined. And I see that outcome. I'm not looking here because if I look here, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to mm-hmm. constantly go back here. But if I'm looking to the forward situation, if I'm looking at things in perspectives of they'll happen for a season, a reason, or a lifetime, just that alone, ladies and gentlemen, just think about the, the stuff that's happened in your life. It happens for a season, a reason, or a lifetime. And so when you're going through that metamorphosis and you're still trying to hang on your old life, guess what, guys, you're going to be stuck. You're going to be stuck in a purgatory of this is what I want to do, but that person doesn't want me to do it. I really want to do this. And I have these dreams to do that, but that person will, oh, I'll play the someday game, hoping, wishing, and praying that something's going to change. And trust me, Justin, I'm going to be 52 next month. I'm proud to say that I love my life, but life goes by super, 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 super fast. One of my baseball heroes just died and I was like, oh my God, he was, and he's just, and it's just like time goes by so fast. And I, my recommendation to everybody is just to always be looking at where you can grow, look at things as opportunities to challenge yourself, to become sharper, to become stronger, to help other people get through that mission. And as soon as you do that, more peace, more happiness, more realization of what's important in our lives really becomes more apparent as we do those things. Because when you give to somebody else who is in need, that is that is probably one of the best feelings in the absolute world you can do for somebody because it reminds you of what it is that you have. And so many times, Justin, we're looking at what we don't have. We're taught to do that. What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? Oh, da, 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 da. I get, I get, I get, oh, if I get something that I feel better, I feel validated. If somebody shows me or gives me something, then that shows and proves my worth. But really, no, what shows and proves your worth is how you treat yourself, how you treat other people. And if you're leaving a mark in this world, that's going to say, hey, I was here and I left it a better place for who I was and what I did. So that's always my mission, man. Agreed. And and I have to say, you don't look 52 like 
you look very young for your age. So, I mean, kudos to you on that. <laughs> um, Thank you. I moisturize, I try, I hydrate, <laughs> and I'm just, I'm a happy person. You know, yeah. I just really um, wake up every day with the intention of serving and making the world a better place. And uh, yeah, but thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And, and back to what you're saying about kind of just realizing how much we do have. One thing that I found, I don't know about you, but whenever I, I, I do take some time to introspect and think about, wow, I am really blessed. I have all of these great things in my life, luxuries, necessities, all, all of those things checked off, you know. Um, it almost, you know, it, it makes me feel really humbled as in like, why was I so blessed? And, and that almost turns into a sense of responsibility of giving back, like you said. And, and it, it helps to create this sense of like, okay, yeah, like I do have so much that how could I not give back? You know what I mean? Yes, 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 yes. So, love it. Love it. Yeah. I, I wanted to go back and ask another question. You, you mentioned briefly that your grandfather was well off and he kind of had his life together. And then your mother obviously was not, she did not. Um, it was actually, it was actually my sister's father. My grandfather, my grandfather was as well, I see. Okay. but um, yeah, it was my, it was my sister's biological father who was, quote unquote normal, had a nice mm -hmm. job. She got nice clothes. Every time she went there for a couple of weeks, she got the great stuff. She got to come back. And then in, in, in retrospect, because I've done a lot of work on myself mm -hmm. to, to find forgiveness and to find empathy, um, which is massively important in our lives, which I never realized. Um, now seeing, putting myself in her shoes and realizing at seven years old, she has to take care of a brand new baby with a mom who, you know, is already treating her like she treated me. Um, my sister went through a lot. Unfortunately, that's another story. I'm willing to share it, but uh, I wished her well later on in life. I got reconnected with her. It was a crazy story. Um, but no, that was, that was, that was part of the problem is that she, you know, she had a taste of this um, versus a taste of what we had at home. That makes sense. Uh, I, I was really going to ask, why was your mother's lifestyle why did she end up choosing, for lack of a better word, a different lifestyle than your grandfather did, uh, at least from my point of view? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's a great question. And that, that has really helped me understand my mom, Justin. Um, my, when, I, when I think about my life with my mom, uh, I grew up adoring her and idolizing her as a little boy. I have pictures where I'm looking up at her and I just I, all I wanted was her approval. I mean, it was, I never, I never got it. I was so, I wasn't held. I was, I was, there was so, oh, so many different emotional factors, but so I grew up like, okay, you're the one that's supposed to love me. I know you, I know you're protecting me and da da da, but I want you to love me. And, um, and later in life, I tried to understand what was going on with her. And she, and when I became adult, uh, because that wasn't the only situation I had to go with her being homeless and leaving. There was other situations in my life. I'm actually writing a book about her and I, and the journey. I've had a lot of people say that that's going to be a movie. Um, and people really need to hear that. Um, but it wasn't until I said, you know, one time I said, mom, how old are you? And she's like, I'm four. And she used to always say that my mom was incredibly book smart, brilliant. I mean, she was, she was chaotically brilliant. It's one of those idiot savant things. Like she, she talked to doctors, like she was a doctor. Wow. She studied medical manuals. She knew how to talk to them. They're like, where did you go to school? Mrs. Blake? Oh, I went to Johns Hopkins university. She never went to school for doctor, but she knew all of that stuff. It was crazy, but people smart. She was stupid as hell. Um, but when I started picking back in her brain, when she kept saying, I'm four, I'm four, I'm four. I'm like, mom, you're 40 years old. You're an adult. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. And she played with an, uh, stuffed animals. She always had the cats around. And so later in life, I was like, four years old, stuffed animals, cats, childlike. Huh? What happened at four? Her parents got divorced. So her mom and her dad divorced when she was four years old. Her mom, my grandmother, not a nice person, uh, very strict, very disciplined. They grew up, you know, she grew up, my mom had all the best of everything. She had the best food. My grandmother went without, but the whole thing was you're going to be smart. So she got her hands smacked. She got all sorts of things happening to her unless she was brilliant. She graduated high school at 16. She went to Santa Barbara college at uh, 17 or 18. I have actually proof of it now because I didn't believe her. But when, after she died, I went through some papers. I'm like, holy shit. She was actually telling the truth. Cause my mom told stories for days. Mm -hmm. She was a race car driver. She was a model. She was all these different things. It was really sad. Um, and so kind of looking back at why she didn't turn out like, you know, a normal person would is she was, she became a victim of her own belief system that her parents divorced because of her. And so as a result, her father became very distant. Her father didn't want to deal with her or his ex-wife. So he created this life and he created a great life. And she was a part of it on special occasions. So her, like me was always fighting for that male attention. So if you go back and you look at classic psychology, like, okay, you know, everybody's like, where's the dad, where's the daddy syndrome come from? Well, because they want the fatherly influence. They want that. 
Uh, and so through her life, she was making decisions to a try to get her father's affection and get her attention. She went into purchasing and, and, and went into aerospace and all like, Oh, daddy, you know, they used to talk about it. She, I remember this now as a kid, she would always try to impress them like, Oh, daddy, or, or she would say father, Oh, father, you know, I did this today with this contract. And I didn't realize it at the time, but in retrospect, she was constantly trying to get her father's validation and her father's affection. So she became brilliant, smart, because that's what her mom wanted to do. So she wanted that affection, but then she wasn't getting the male affection. She didn't have that fatherly influence. So she resorted to, you know, men in her life uh, to kind of seek that validation. And what she did is she scripted a different identity for herself to be who she thought everybody else wanted her to be, to get that validation. Because inside she was a scared, lonely little girl who had stuffed animals and cats that always gave her unconditional love. So yeah, it's just a matter. We got to get out of that self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. We got to get out of those negative cycles. And that takes a lot of balls. That takes a lot of courage. And usually it takes somebody on the outside. And that's why I do what I do as a no excuses coach is I'm not a therapist, a psychologist, but I have a way of getting through to people to change their perspective about their past, their present and their future, to have a, a way of a mindset to say, and this is what, what your viewers could take away. Just ask the question, do I believe, simple question, do I believe that life is happening for me or to me? Just that delineation. I've talked to, oh, how life, everything keeps happening to me. Everything's, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. They're building the story of why they're not successful. They're, they're reinforcing why they are going to be a victim for the rest of their life. And I said, let's just change that perspective just for a second. Did, did me becoming homeless, digging through dumpsters, you know, having to have the guy at the Burger King give me the sandwiches that people ate that did, they didn't like just so I could cut it off and eat something, all the different things that I went through. Did that happen for me or did it happen to me? And when I decided that it happened for me, um, one of the greatest gifts in my life, Justin, was to be able to go back. I had somebody who knew I became a speaker and a coach. Um, and I said to him at a bar one day, I said, man, the biggest dream I have is to go back to the seventh grade school that I dropped out of and go tell those kids, listen, you're going to make it. You're going to go through a lot of stuff in your life. You're going to go through a lot of adversity. You're going to have people call you names and tell you, but you're going to make it if you want to. And here, let me tell you my story. And it was funny enough. He said, what school did you go to? And I said, I went to Brookers Junior High in Anaheim, California. And here we are in Southern California. He goes, he goes, say that name again. I said, Brookers Junior High. And he goes, he goes, my wife's the head PE coach there. And I'm like, yeah, right. The one on Brookers? He goes, yeah. And I'm like, whoa. And he goes, she's personal friends with the principal. Let me talk to my wife tonight. Nonchalantly thinking, yeah, whatever. A couple of days, he calls me up. He goes, yeah, uh, here's the principal's number. They would love to have you. They think it'd be a great story. They're going to call the local paper that, you know, this homeless kid who went on this journey uh, is going to come back and tell these kids, you know, what's up. I was like, what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And so I asked my friend who's a videographer. He's like, dude, I want to come video this. So I went down there. It's on my YouTube page. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life, Justin, to, 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 to go walk back. I, I'd driven by the school and seen it but I'd never set foot on that campus since I left. And I didn't know I was leaving the last time I was leaving. I just went home and my mom said, we can't, you can't go back. We have to move. We're losing the house. We got to sell stuff. And so I just became like a, like a, like a, a, a witness protection program. Cause they're like, where's Chris? He should be in school. <laughs> when I walked back on that, 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 that black top and I walked back in that gymnasium, I remember just why, Holy fuck. Oh my God. Oh my God. I did it. I, 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 I left this place and I'm still alive and I'm coming back to tell these guys how to do it. I did it. I did it. I did it. I made my trash mean something. And afterwards, Justin, I didn't know what to expect. I had kids coming up and hugging me and, I, and it was crazy. Cause I, when I first walked on the campus, I asked people, I'm like, are you sure this is junior high? These kids like they're look like they're in elementary. And Cause my vision of what I was was I thought I was a man at 13. I thought I was a grown up man. And I was like, these that, that's 13. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's 13. That's 15. I'm like, it just it hit me. I'm like, I was a little kid when I became homeless. Yeah. I had no idea. And talking to those kids, they were like, oh, hey, you know, we're homeless right now. We're living in my friend's house or I'm living at Olive Crest Children's Home, which is a place I mentor. Um, and just seeing that was like instant concrete. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go help people get through that stuff because if I can do it, they can do it. And that's what became my mission in my life was to help people stop being a victim in their own circumstances, no matter what their story was or is, I mean, I've helped people who've been massively victimized, change their story. Wow. Uh, it's funny how life sometimes gives you those opportunities where you're not expecting it. And if you're not paying attention, like they can pass you by the wayside and you can forget the meaning of those stories. And it's interesting, someone with a really bad attitude, someone who's like, life just keeps happening. The same thing could happen to them. I guarantee you this, the same thing could happen to them. And they would just be like, oh, that was a fluke. You know, that was just me getting lucky. Whereas someone with the opposite would be like, wow, 
like I'm really blessed and like all these things came together and, and those things continually happen to people with the different mindset of like, you know, life is happening for me. You know, I'm here on this journey. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it's all, it's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. It's all about perspective and expectations and beliefs. I have this, uh, sorry, I lost you there. You still there? Hang on a sec. See, I told you I'd freeze. So I have this, <laughs> I, have, I freeze every once in a while. Um, so I have this band on my arm that says, believe, uh, somebody gave that to me in 2013. I've only taken it off for operations and whatever I've had to, mm -hmm. you got to believe, but you know, it's just, again, it's that mindset and anybody can shift that mindset at any point in their life. If they choose to, if they get out of that prescript of, Oh, this is what my life is. This is what my life is going to be. There's no hope. There's no chance. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was comfortable. I was in a 26 year career up until November of 2019, making great money, everything was good. Um, but just realizing our our purpose in life is not to stay comfortable. Our purpose in life is to continue to edge that stuff and, and to go see more beautiful vistas in our life. And if you wanna go see a beautiful view, which we all do, right? But we don't wanna do the work. I wanna go see the mountaintop, but I don't feel like driving three hours to get there. I don't. I wanna go hike, but I really don't feel like the pain of hiking. I wanna go see the beautiful view. Mm -hmm. But in my in my my view of the world, Justin, and, and I, would, I would love to get your, your perspective on this too, my view of the world is that, you know, you have to climb. Why do we go to the gym? We go to the gym to look good, to feel good, to have, to live longer, to, to end for an ultimate goal. But, you know, what do we do? We go in there and we, we work ourselves out to the point of pain because what pain makes us stronger. Pain breaks down the muscle first, and then we do stuff to repair that muscle and that muscle becomes stronger. That is the same thing about life, ladies and gentlemen. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this, that is the same purpose in life. You have to be excited about the pain because the pain is growth. The pain is growth. It's opportunity, mistakes, failures, all that stuff. If your perspective is that a mistake or a failure is negative, guess what? Then you're going to be afraid to be, make mistakes and failure because you're afraid of people, what they're going to say. And I know you might have to bleep this out. And if you don't, fuck what people say, <laughs> what people say, we're here for a minute. Nobody's thinking about you. Nobody's thinking about me. They're thinking about themselves. Mm -hmm. Go do what you need to do. You have to step out of that mindset and you have to sit there and look at pain like, Man, I'm excited about going through this. Leaving my corporate career was 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 pretty devastating in a way because it wasn't planned. Let me just say it that way. I knew it was coming in such a way, and I knew I needed to leave. But God just kind of went, "Hey, you know, you you've been playing comfortably miserable for long enough." And God has a way of doing that. Universe source, whatever you believe in. I'm not a religious person, but I believe something in the universe said, "Chris, you've played it comfortably safe for a long enough time. You want to go become a coach. You want to go do these shows. It's time for you to go do it." And if my perspective would have been anger and misery and resentment and all that other stuff, which was initially my, my reaction, because we do react, we're emotional beings. But once I started processing and responding and saying, you know what, reason season or a lifetime, that was a season of my life. That was a chapter of my life. That life is now done. I could choose to look back and wish I had that life again. I could try to recreate that life because it's comfortable and it's familiar. And it's what I know. Or I could sit there and choose like, Right now is a weird, you know, at that point, it was a really weird and awkward situation for me. It was vulnerable. I was like, what do I do? How do I identify myself? But I just kept going and said, you know what? There's something here to learn. And the sooner I commit to learning it and getting through it, as soon as I, you know, like a workout, as soon as I commit to doing the six week program, this 12 week program, I am going to feel better and have different results. So in that mindset, I said, okay, this is a fight again. This is something again, I have not made it. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm financially well, but this is another opportunity for me to say, listen, I could either retreat or say, I'm going to do it in six months. Or I could say, you know what, in six months, it's still going to be here right now. It's here. Let's tackle this right now. And that's the way we have to look at life is like, you know, I'm going to get to that next Vista. I made a Vista before it was beautiful and it was awesome and it was comfortable and it was safe. But now I'm like, now I get to impact more people. And in that time, Justin, of letting go of what was, I have amassed so much because my focus is on serving. My focus is on where it is I'm going and who I'm becoming. I'm not that person anymore. It's been a year and a half. I'm not even that person anymore. I couldn't go back to that life now if I wanted to. I'm so different now. I'm so me and I'm so in charge of my life. So that's my encouragement to everybody is to stop looking where you've been, see where you're going and have that vision and have that belief system and have the right people around you. Because if the five people around you say, oh, that's stupid. You shouldn't do that. That's safe. You should stay where it's safe and certain. Don't, don't ask for more. Don't be selfish. Da, da, da. You need different people in your life because you won't succeed in where you want to go unless you have people going, Chris, you got to do that. You have to do that. It's going to be tough. It's going to be miserable, but you're going to come out the other side stronger. And then you're going to help other people go through it too. What are your thoughts on that, Justin? With asking people, so many people, you know, what's the toughest thing they've done? What are a couple of the, the nuggets that you have received in the time that you've been interviewing people and asking that question? I'm curious to know. <laughs> um, I've, I've gotten a lot of nuggets. Um, and, and as you can see, 
the the logo of the hard thing podcast is a mountain and it's a mountain for a reason and i love how you said you know we're meant to climb uh, and especially your discourse on pain see pain is this interesting thing because inherently it doesn't have a narrative it's a fact right but it's this it's this really powerful fact that when we add a narrative to that it changes us it's this catalyst right um by doing push-ups you get tired you get fatigued you break down muscle that's a fact but how you view that allows you to change yourself in a really interesting way and i think one of the best things just like the mountain going through pain one, one of the biggest treasures you get and and talking to all the guests because I'm, I'm just blown away like people like you chris just the wisdom and the insights in in just their daily life and doing these hard things is by climbing the mountain of pain or discomfort or challenge or hard things, the biggest thing you get is perspective. You get to be at the top of the mountain and, and see far off and understand the lay of the land and understand kind of how things really are. You get perspective at reality. And I think it's, it's very beautiful that we do get that opportunity, but only if we take it, like you can climb the mountain and not look out and see the, the grand views and the vistas, like you said, or you can, you know, it's all a matter of what you choose to do as you're going up the mountain. Does that make sense? No, no, no. Perfect. Perfect. And thank you for sharing that with me. It's, it's interesting. I'll, I'll share something else with you guys. Um, I'm very transparent. I'm very authentic about everything that I've been through. I never claim to know it all or be it all. Um, but let's see, my son's four. Um, I'm bad at time because time just flies <laughs> by. Uh, probably yeah. about six years ago. Um even for me, Mr. Master Motivator, Mr. Kickass, Mr. Always Positive, Mr. Helping Everybody. Even even before my son came into our life, uh, I was I was comfortable at my job, you know. And I, there's a great book out there called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Uh, what's interesting is I've been on Clubhouse a lot lately, and people have been mentioning that book. Um, that book for me really got me out of where I was. High, I mean, coming from where I came, and to be making over a hundred thousand dollars a year having an office with a window, having a team, having five weeks of vacation, having great medical expenses, ha having every other Friday off. I was great. I was, I'm like, Oh my God, I have money to buy something on Amazon and not think about, can I make my gas bill? You know, I made it. I was like, oh, I can go on vacation every three or four years. You know, I never went anywhere. So I now had the ability to save money and go to Hawaii. I'd never been to Hawaii. And you know, it was scary. It was like, man, I love coaching and I love speaking. And I love helping everybody. You know, that's my zone of excellence. My leadership and everything is my zone or my zone of excellence, but I'm not in my zone of genius. And when you read that book, you really get inspired to know that, you know, there's always more, there's always more to give. There's always more to learn. And the people I have surrounded myself with now, Justin, even looking back, I was so upset at the friendships and the brotherhoods that I thought I had in my corporate life for 26 years. The people that I was by their their, their family members' bedsides in the hospitals with my team. I mean, I, I gave and loved my team. And that disconnect, once that happened, really kind of identified to me that, you know, things really are chapters in a book. And that's the way I truly vision in life, you know, and I want your viewers to get this. Um, when a chapter, when we're reading a book, we the end that chapter, what are we doing? We're excited to go read what's next. We're excited. What's, where's this book going? Where's it? What else am I supposed to learn? Where's the writer going? What's the writer's message? Right. But in our life, if we think about writing a book in our life, which I absolutely do, what do we do? We close a chapter, but yet we still kind of still go back and, and open those pages. Oh yeah. 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 Remember this, remember this, remember this, you know, you've been around people like that. They're constantly in, Oh, remember in college, remember in this, remember this. I want to be around people like, oh my God, when COVID's over, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to hug people. I'm going to go here. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go do different things. I'm going to, I, I miss, I want to go windsurfing, you know, people, there's two different types of people in this world. Um, so again, it just goes back to having that perspective and always looking at the opportunity of what's next. Well, how can I serve differently? And ultimately, Justin, another tidbit for your audience, that's been massive for myself and my clients, uh, especially when I did it. Um, and I'll share the story real quick. Uh, I was, uh, it was about 2008 successful and everything. I went to a, a funeral for my, one of my coworkers who I knew, but I did not know deeply. And I sat in the back of the church as I usually do. I'm not a church person. Uh, I sat at the back of the church, my arms folded and, you know, kind of, okay, I want to hear pay respects and everything. And, and just a normal situation. We don't like them, but we go and we do our respects. And as I watched everybody get up there and eulogize, uh, Anne, her name was Ann. Um, you know, I sat there and I started thinking. And also my friend, Dave Riley gets up there, pink tie. He starts blubbering. He's the biggest dude. He starts blubbering. I loved Anne. She was so sweet. She was so this. And I got choked up and I thought, 
And this is a question for you guys to ask yourself. I love questions because if you answer the question, honestly, you can get to the point where you want to go really quickly, but most people avoid the question or they don't answer it. Honestly, I sat there and I said, if I died tomorrow, who would show up and what would they say about Christopher? And at that point I was still successful. I was doing, I had made it out and, but I was honest with myself. I'm like, if, if I died tomorrow, 10, 25 people would show up. They would probably bring beer and Jack Daniels. They would probably gather around and say, Oh my God, dude, remember that time Chris did this? Oh my God. Remember that time he did this, you know, the stupid thing or that stupid thing. And the people, Oh, you know, he was good. You know, he, but he was homeless. And then he, he, he made something of his life, but Oh yeah. Remember that time he did this. I did not want to be remembered for Chris being that guy. You know, my, my mark in the world was not to be a party animal to chase girls or to, you know, to do crazy things. My, my purpose in life was like, huh, what am I really here for? Because up until that point, it was all about striving. It was all about accomplishing. It was all about, you know, protecting what I got because, you know, I was this homeless kid. So I was always in survival mode. And when I, when I, when after Dave went up there, I was driving home and I was like, Hmm, I'm going to go home and write my eulogy which is something people don't, we don't want to think about. Death used to scare the absolute bejesus out of me. Even when I was a little kid, I couldn't even go to sleep because I thought I was dying. Once I learned about death, I thought sleep was dying. And then I had a nightmare. I couldn't sleep for a long time. So I went home and I took pen to paper, not computer. I just took pen to paper and I said, uh, we are here today uh, uh, sharing the memory of the life of Christopher Roush. And I didn't know what to do, what to say. And I said, he was this, blah, 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 blah. And I got down to the bottom of paper and part of my brain was like, okay, this is kind of lame, but I took away the self-judgment, did it all got down to the bottom. I said, I'm going to commit to doing this. And I put the pen down and I read it out loud. I was by myself. I read it out loud. And funny enough, halfway through it, I started having tears run down my face because I realized, Hey, that's going to happen one day. There's no denying it. We're all going to go. We can go tomorrow. We go 10 minutes from now. We go 20 years from now, whatever it is, but we're going to go. And that letter will be read. That letter will, I was like, it was cement for me. I was, I was in my thirties, but it was like, wow, this will happen one day. And I still get chills. And I got to the bottom of it and still had to, and I was like, wow, this is huge. And the last part of it, Justin, and it's never changed. It's never changed that Christopher Roush will have fought for what was right and what was fair. He will have left the earth a better place for who he will. Who, no, <laughs> sorry. I always get it right. He will have fought for what was right and what was fair. He will risk the for which that mattered. And he will have left the earth a better place for who he was and what he did. There wasn't things in there about him becoming a rock star because I used to play guitar and sing and I wanted to become a musician. It wasn't anything about my car being on the front page of Hot Rod Magazine, all these different goals that I had. It was about the impact and the person that I was and the people I, I left memories with that, that told them that their life mattered. And from that point on, I was like, okay, I'm not going to focus on these things because obviously they're not that important. They're important, but they're, they're, they're superficialists, they're superficial. They're, they're ego stuff. And I, I started my company master motivators that year and I got committed and I got driven about using my story and using my experience to go help other people. And it's been a tremendous ride ever since then. It hasn't been perfect, uh, but it's just absolutely amazing. So there's just so many different things we could do. And on top of that, once you have your legacy written, you have a map to where you're going. Most people don't know where they're going. All they know is where they've been. So when you have that, when you get up every single day and you're like struggling with your weight, you're struggling with your health, you're struggling with being in a miserable position or a miserable relationship. All you have to do is ask yourself one question. You go to the mirror, you look at yourself in the eyes and you say, is this whatever I'm about to do getting me closer to or further from my stated goal? Well, your legacy is your stated goal. So if you're about to eat a ding dong and you're saying your, your stated goal is to live long enough to see your kids have grandkids, put the fucking ding dong down. If you're saying your goal is to do this and you're like, I don't feel like exercising today. Well, go exercise for 20 minutes because that's going to get you to your goal of what it is that you're stating you want to do. But if you're doing stuff that, that jeopardizes that success, you're being incongruent and you either need a coach, you need an accountability partner, or you need to change your goals. So I'll let you ask me some more questions. I'm just passionate, man. So thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. No, yeah, I, I've enjoyed this so much. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. I, I know we, we've passed up the hour. I don't want to take up too much of your time. You can ask um, me. We can keep going, dude. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in it to, to help people. That's, 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 I, honestly, I love it. I could do it all day. And that's right. how, how I found out what I'm meant to do. When you can do something for hours and hours and hours and not think about it, mm -hmm. it's truly an honor for me. I, I have no problem, but I want to respect your time as well. Okay, okay. Um, well, no problem. I could talk that... for another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> think, and it's unfortunate because I had so many more questions, but I actually got to... Anyways, um, let's transition to the last couple of questions that I always ask my guests. As far as action items, I came up with um, three. Let me know if you want to add any to this list. So the first one that I want our audience to do is to work on changing their mindset from a victim mindset to a victor mindset. And then 
the the second two or the next two are to ask those questions you said ask do i believe life is for me or to me and then ask if i died tomorrow who would show up and what would they say are there any more action items you'd like to add to that list um yes definitely one i've kind of talked about a little bit but this is a powerful exercise it's super easy um take take literally a piece of paper we all got paper just take the paper um draw a line across the top draw a line down the bottom make like a t on the left hand side write positive and right on the right side write negative and then list the five people you're around the most one two three four five put their names down without thinking about it are those people the people in your life who are telling you the truth are those people in your life the ones that say yes you should go do that if it's dangerous yes you should go do that if you're taking a risk yes i'm going to be here for you to help you do that if that person is positive put positive if that person is somebody that potentially holds you back or wants you to be safe or wants you to be doesn't want you to move on because it's going to be uncomfortable for them put negative and realize that there are people in your life if those five people aren't smarter brighter and where it is that you want to be that is so critical hang around people are where you want to be and don't feel inferior don't feel imposter syndrome don't any of that stuff no 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 everybody, all of us start somewhere all i started somewhere everybody every all i know the greats i hung out with les brown we all start somewhere we're all more alike than we are different uh, and just do that and take a look at that list and even if it's family members even if it's a spouse you know i'm not saying necessarily ditch them to the curb but those critical people in your life if they are really not going hey this is a great idea you should do this you should go live your life then you honestly need to get other people in your life and that that's that's tough like i said before we could have another show about it um i had to wish my sister well i have a great life i wish you well but i'm not going to stand up for that because my life means more important things to me than trying to save you save you when you don't want to be saved um so yeah there's that um you know always invest in yourself always grow yourself always look at having a plan if your goals aren't written down write your goals down it blows my mind how many people justin who oh i have these goals i'm like where are they written oh they're up here complete bullshit complete 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 there is a psychological situation that happens in your brain when you start writing stuff down because you're making a commitment you're saying it's up here but i just told the world when you put it on paper i just told the world i'm going to do it and it doesn't have to be overnight it just has to be something every single day there's 365 days in a year if you do one thing every single day that moves you closer if your goal is to get healthier and you just do one thing you push yourself i walk i walked a block today i've done this with people go walk a block tomorrow walk a block and a half walk two blocks that i've gotten people running just by that little compound interest principle so yeah man i could i could go on for hours but uh ultimately people just have to believe that um this is an opportunity for you guys to grow and to get stronger and it doesn't matter when you start just start because life goes by real quick and uh for me it's no regrets so no regrets serve people and uh just be awesome wow i love that super impactful and uh Lots of homework for me personally in this simple little action item list. Uh, that's one of the benefits of, of doing this show is I always get like uh, action items from really awesome people like you, Chris. But how can our audience reach out to you, support you and, and see what you're up to? No, Justin, thank you, man. It's been a pleasure. I, I love being on shows and I love your authenticity. And I just want to say something as well. Uh, I want to applaud you. I want to applaud you because, you know, some people look at me and especially with the comparison shit that goes on in our life, you know, the social media, all that person's doing this, this person is doing this. One last suggestion I have for everybody. And this is something that every single one of you can do. And it'll be interesting um, is to go Google this video jump by Steve Harvey, Steve Harvey, the comedian, the talk show host, go Google the video jump. It's two minutes. It's less than two minutes long. That is what life is about. That is what, I mean, I watched thousands of hours of, of motivational content on YouTube. Thousands. I mean, I'm constantly learning and growing and watching yeah. that video for two minutes has been by far the most recommended video of my life that I've told people about, because when my coach told me to watch it, when I was sitting there being scared of going out of survival mode into thrival mode, you know, worried about what I might lose. And if I could become homeless again and all the other shit, when I changed my perspective and I watched that video, I'm like, that was it. It was it. It was like, nope cutting the sales. I'm, I'm going for this because that's what I want to do. So I encourage your listeners to go do that. Uh, to connect with me, it's super easy. My website's being redesigned right now, but if you go to ChristopherRausch.com, R-A-U-S-C-H, ChristopherRausch.com or the no excuses coach.com, all my links are going to be there. But yeah, if you just literally Google the no excuses coach, my social media pops up. I have a great YouTube page. It's youtube.com forward slash Christopher Roush. 
Uh, I've got two of my shows there. I do the raw and unscripted show every Tuesday night. That's just me and a guest going raw and unscripted about life and about what you guys can do. I do another show Friday nights called the unfiltered experience. All of those are playlists in there. Another thing I do for people is I just do a walk and talk. It's just me and a camera walking with my dog. Um, just giving life advice right then it's straight. It's unfiltered. It's just me talking and people dig those. Um, so yeah, I would just love to connect with anybody. And if you guys reach out and let me know that you saw me here on Justin's podcast, I'd love to help you out. If you have any questions, uh, if you're struggling right now, I'm doing free complimentary coaching calls just to help people get through this time and hopefully they pay it forward and help other people or, you know, they may have me as a coach, but I just want to see the world become a better place. Um, I am committed to that. I'm on a board of directors now for help heal humanity. I am, I'm, I'm so passionate about making this world a better place and healing a lot of the turmoil and the pain that's going on. So I just invite all of you guys out there to become part of the solution and not be part of the problem. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. I, I appreciate that. I'm going to get all that up in the show notes, but I appreciate you and, and how you show up and, and how you've inspired me in this simple little podcast, but, uh, thanks for so much being on my show. Hey man, no brother. Anytime you want me back, I'm happy to come back. I love sharing this and I appreciate all the great questions and having me on the show in the first place, Justin. I mean, uh, kudos to you. But again, what I was going to say is we all start somewhere. Sometimes yeah. my, my, my thoughts get off a of track. So, you know, always, if you want to do a podcast, start doing it. Don't worry about having beautiful things like this. Just start <laughs> doing it. So I applaud you, dude. Yeah. We all start somewhere, keep going. And, and I love your, your passion and your mission of what you want to do with this show. So kudos to you, brother. Thanks so much. Thank you guys for listening to today's episode. What did I tell you? Christopher is just a fun guy. Uh, and, and he's very motivating. Let me tell you that. Um, me and him had a, such a great conversation. And like I said, he gave me a lot of really good advice personally uh, on what I'm trying to do and, and build here. So uh, again, thanks, Christopher, if you're listening. I really appreciate you being on my show. And audience, go in and uh, reach out to Christopher. Tell him you like the show. I know he'd really appreciate that. And make sure you guys do the action items because you will appreciate that. Now, if you want to support the show, there are a couple of things you can you can do. So first thing, actually, you can go get a free audiobook. You heard me right. So go get a free audiobook today from Audible, uh, where you can get over 180,000 titles of all sorts of genres. And actually, I want to give you the audiobook for free. So go to audibletrial.com slash the heart thing podcast, get a free audiobook today, as well as start your, start your free 30 day trial. Now you can get all sorts of different books and things like that. Um, I know that Chris mentioned one today. Uh, he mentioned The Big Leap by Gabe Hendricks as the book. So you should go get that book on Audible. Again, audibletrial.com slash the hard thing podcast. Get your free audiobook today. Next thing you can do to support the show is subscribe. Make sure you never miss a single episode. Like I said, episodes on Mondays and Thursdays. And if you feel so inclined, go ahead and share the show with someone you know. Uh, think about someone who maybe just doesn't feel it in their life. They're, they're stuck or unmotivated. Go ahead and share the show with them because I guarantee you, thanks to Chris, they will feel motivated. Now, I want to talk to you about something serious. Child sex trafficking. Uh, it's a bad thing. We all agree. So, what are we doing to stop it? Well... I would like to invite you to join us in our campaign to raise $1,000 for Operation Underground Railroad. They're a nonprofit organization and they go undercover to stop child sex trafficking and they need lots of help. So if you want to help us raise money for them, go to gofundme.com slash overcoming dash average, donate some money today. Even just $1 helps. All the money goes straight towards OUR so they can rescue kids. <clears throat> Thank you guys again for listening to the show. I know that you're getting better out there. I know that you're having better lives because of these conversations. So keep keep it up, you know, keep doing hard things because every time you do hard things, you will overcome average.